The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Invisible Influence Series. If you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion, then make sure you text the word COMPEL to 411321. That's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1-909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Welcome to the Influencer's Edge. This is the place where you come to get the latest breakthroughs, cutting edge insights, tools, and techniques to leapfrog over the pack in sales, persuasion, and influence. Be sure you visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com. And while you're there, Subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, tune in, and enjoy today's episode. The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Invisible Influence Series. If you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion, then make sure you text the word COMPEL to 411321. That's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1-909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Thank you for tuning in to the Influencer's Edge, where you get the latest breakthroughs, cutting-edge insights, tools and techniques so you can leapfrog over the pack at sales, influence, and persuasion. Remember to visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com to enjoy even more great episodes like this one. We look forward to seeing you again on The Influencers Edge Show. All right, we have an amazing guest today. I'm going to try not to fanboy on him because I became a fan of his when I started watching the Behavior Panel channel on YouTube. He is a, a colleague of my friend Chase Hughes. We're both friends with Chase. He is none other than Mark has an amazing uh, biography. I have it pulled up here on my phone. But Mark Bowden is a world-renowned body language expert, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and this is a real feather in your cap. You were voted Global Guru's number one body language professional in the world. Your unique gesture playing system of nonverbal communication helps audiences manage, maximize the power of using their own body language to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including members of the G7. I don't think you had so many best-selling books. Do you want to name just a couple of titles of your books that are, that have been bestsellers? Yeah, so uh, there's one up there. Truth and Lies is what people are really thinking uh, by myself and co-author Tracy Thompson. And uh, you want to check out as well Winning Body Language, which was the first book that I wrote as well. Both great books. Now, I did some more extensive research into you. I did a deep dive into you. You have a background in theater. And also it says you're, you have an IMDb. Did you, were you really in Lord of the Rings, Return of the King? Yeah, I was. Yeah, absolutely. I was in uh, Return of the King. I think we won more uh, Academy Awards than any other film in history. On oh, were, you, uh, were you an orc, uh, elf? What I, you? Yeah, I am in the orc department. I did uh, a number of uh, orc voices, including uh, one of the kind of bigger, chiefer, Orcs, gosh, no. <laughs> now, or, an orc would definitely be rated, uh, you have said, within a fraction of a second. People yeah. from the brainstem decide is someone going to be, there's, there is a friend, friend, enemy, potential sexual partner, or indifference. Indifference. So, an yeah. orc would probably be with the Raw with a twisted person, a potential sexual partner. <laughs> yeah, so you've got with an orc, you've got to hit predator immediately with the voice. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you, I'll test my orc voice on my little dog, Peach. And she doesn't, she doesn't like the orc voice at all. Because, of course, the orc voice instantly uh, will tell any animal that the, it's a predator and it's very, very big and aggressive. Now, one of the things I heard you say, I also met you, had the pleasure of meeting you in person at the uh, behavior panel event. Yeah. Uh, I, before I get to that, I do want to talk about, so what I heard, I've heard you say is within the first microsecond, we make a snap judgment as to which category people fit into. And then the neocortex begins to cherry pick data. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that process? Yeah, so, you know, my understanding is is, is you can get a, a still image into your mind in about 1 50th of a second. And so that would be enough for your instinct to go on, that kind of flash of seeing a picture, working out is this friend, enemy, mate, or indifference. It is going to have to be able to make a decision in that amount of time, and then it's going to use that framework in order to cherry-pick data that's going to fit with that framework. It's not, it's not looking for, for contrary information. It's looking for all the information that supports its initial judgment because it wants to make quick decisions, know how to behave really fast for, for your benefit. My instinct, my reptilian brain is in it for me. Yours is in it for you. Uh, it's not a social part of the brain. Of course, the social part of the brain, the social mammalian brain is in it for people like us you know, our in groups rather than our out groups, but our reptilian brain is just uh, interested in my survival right now and does what, what I would call best fit thinking around that. Now, if, uh, one of the things that struck me about your category is the category of indifferent. I've heard mm. you say there's 7 billion people on the planet. And yeah, it's about 7.6, 7.6 to 7.8 billion people on the planet, yeah. And you have said that we put most people in the category of different, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially if you live in a highly densely populated area, which, you know, many people on the planet have moved out of the countryside um, and moved into dense populations, which means we need to be indifferent to the majority of people out there. Otherwise, how would we get on our, in our day? Look, if you were, you know, a, an individual, a lone individual working the fields, okay, if, if a stranger came past, you know, and you're in the middle of the countryside, you would probably stop and you'd spend more time working out what on earth is that person doing in your territory, your environment. But in a metropolis, you have to be indifferent to the majority of people, else you would not be able to get on with your day. And yet we have acts of extraordinary courage and altruism that go completely, uh, I don't know if it's opposite, maybe it's complementary to that idea. How would you explain extraordinary acts of altruism where people will just risk their lives for a stranger where they are not indifferent, where, where yeah. they have every reason to be marked? And yet they'll risk their lives to that stranger. Yeah, I mean, that's that, the beautiful dichot dichotomy of human beings is that we are designed to be indifferent to the majority of people. However, we're also designed to shoot wide. You know, if, 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 if I'm there and I'm even trained to kill other human beings, I'm most likely to shoot wide if I can see your two eyes and a mouth. If I can see you as another part of my genetic group, I'm designed not to kill you and not to let you die. However, if you're fine, if you're living, okay, I'm designed to be indifferent to you. So there is, you know, if, if, if you are in distress um, and, and other social elements aren't aren't in action at that point because even you in distress if one person starts to ignore you and another person starts to ignore you I'm most likely to look the other way and ignore you so there is that element there as well but if if you're in distress and and it's just me there I'm designed to help you so look it, it, human beings are a complex system and so just saying hey you're designed to be indifferent to people that's really about large groups of people in a metropolis and how do we get on with life when there's huge populations 
how do we shift people? I have found as a professional persuader and salesperson myself, and I don't want to necessarily want to put you in those categories, but I found that the most difficult category of people to deal with are the indifferent. If someone's angry at me and is having a strong emotional response, I can break that pattern. I can do a pattern interrupt. I can channel that energy. I can turn it around. What's your advice for dealing with people who are just plain indifferent? Yeah, so you've, you know, my best advice would be show them the information that triggers them that you are in friend category, okay? Because they will be designed to, to watch you and, and see where the benefit might be. But, you know, there are some people who get themselves attention by being in predator category because you do get attention. If, if the instinct is triggered with predator, you will get people looking at you, but they won't, put, they won't put what you're doing or what you're saying in a positive frame. They'll put it in a negative frame. Best bet is get seen and get seen in a positive frame in order to avoid indifference. Now, you demonstrated this. I have to tell you, I liked every presenter, every teacher, everyone who shared their breadth of knowledge uh, at the behavior panel event. It took me a little while to warm up to Greg Hart. I love Greg. It turns out he's an incredibly warm and loving human being when you get to know him. And he just has that face. But as soon as you came out on stage, you came out with an energy, uh, a, I have to say, a stage presence mm -hmm. that you don't quite see any other people. So I want to circle back to this question. How did your work in theater and in acting and studying with the satirical community comedian how does in what way did that get you interested in what you do today and how does it inform your work today does it have any place in your work today oh absolutely i mean all of my techniques really go back to the primary training that i had in that area which was a, a primary training that was handed down from teacher to pupil teacher to pupil it isn't written down in fact my gesture playing system wasn't written down until i wrote my my first book on that and yet that goes back elements of it go back to uh jacques lecoq jacques copeau um etienne de Creux, and then from that into gets lost in the mists of time probably within the italian commedia dell'arte the professional wow. comedy actors of of italy and from that back into greek theater so so look you know let's just talk about what i picked up, I, I guess, from uh, Dario Fo, which is who you're talking about there, who, who is a uh, Nobel laureate um, in, in satirical theatre, changed or certainly influenced the political landscape of Italy, which is a bizarre political landscape. And he did that using the old techniques of the Commedia dell'arte. In fact, his, his wife, Franca Rame, can trace herself back to the original medieval families that were doing the Commedia. Understand the Commedia was so potent that the Pope in around, I'm gonna say 1706, at the time of the Lisbon earthquakes, banned speaking in theater. Banned it, said you so potent, it was so satirical, the Pope believed that he could be taken down by mere actors, mere th and just remember that an actor shot one of your presidents. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> understand that that the artists understand the artists have been the most potent yeah. force on yeah. changing yeah. people's minds because yeah. we know how to manipulate images, and it's the images that are going to change your mind. So, look to, to your point, Paul, of how do I come on? How do I come on? And you go, wow, I got to watch this person. There's something going on here. One word, pleasure, pleasure. I walk on and I'm in a state of pleasure. It is an absolute pleasure for me to be there, okay? I'm not concerned about myself. All I'm concerned about is you and showing you the pleasure of being there. Make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. How, here's an, another question. I'm very theatrical myself. I have a background in improvisational theater. Yeah. I always love to be the center of attention. So I have no problem being on stage. It's a pleasure for me as well. But we're not all wired that way. We don't all have that personal history. So how do you, if you were working with someone, and I know you have 
very high profile clients. You can't reveal who they are, and that's great. But you will even work with the staging. Like my client is not going to sit in that chair. They're not going to be yep. play. How do you take a client who's paying you a handsome sum, I'm assuming, how do you get a client of yours to feel pleasure if they're camera shy or, do you understand what I'm saying? What are yeah. some techniques for prepping them? Yeah, I help them be less self-aware, less self-conscious, less consciousness about themselves at that time and more consciousness about the audience. Everything, when, when my client goes in front of, of the audience, whether it's millions of people because they're a leader or a few people because they're trying to persuade a board, they focus entirely on the audience entirely on that audience so that they themselves disappear they don't matter anymore they're just a cipher for the for the for what that audience needs wants um should have essentially so the moment you become less self-conscious that you stop producing those non-verbal communications that will easily trigger an audience into worrying about you and not being concerned about themselves. They're too empathetic towards you. And so they can't, they can't look at their own problem, you know, and they can't have that dealt with by you. But if you can walk on and immediately tell the audience non-verbally, you don't need to worry about me. I've got this handled, I'm gonna be okay. What we need to worry about is you and what you need they relax and they give themselves over and they go, yeah, please help me, help me get this right. Help me be better, help me, help the country move forward. So look, it's all a piece of, of, of partly psychology and partly movement and a combination of the both to help an audience understand that they are the most important thing at that point. The more you talk and the more you give out this wisdom and knowledge and information, the more I'm seeing the connection. Do you think you could be where you're at today without your training in theater, without your training? And I know you did improvisational theater. Mm -hmm. you, you could have done it without that background? Uh, no, not as, not as fast as I'm able to do it and not as, as well as I'm able to do it. There's, there's other people that can, that can probably do what I do, but they'll be too slow. You know, it'll, it'll take too long because they don't have the technique. They don't have the tools. It's not that they can't get there and they don't know a way to get there, but it's like my chisel is so sharp. The saw is so sharp and, you know, the, the blade is so sharp and I know exactly where to put it and exactly how to move it for the, for the economics to work. So I would just say my, my theater and art, more, more importantly, art techniques. So theater is just a part of art. Okay, it's just, it's just a part of that whole area of art. And the point of art is to remind you that you're alive. That's, that's what I say. So I've got techniques that will remind the audience that they are a living human being. Yeah. And when that happens, when somebody walks on and that whole audience goes, damn, I'm alive. Look, I'm like, I've forgotten about all those things that I was thinking about in my history or all those things that I'm thinking about in the future. And I'm just here now with all these people and this person on stage in front of me. It's, it's being able to create that moment that causes an audience to go, I'll follow that person. That's an incredible power to create an entirely present moment focus, not in the past, not in the future. It's completely a present moment focus. I never thought about it that way before, but that's that's an unbelievable, it's one thing to get rapport with an audience. Eh, okay, everyone is doing it. It's over time, in my opinion. But to get yeah. people into a present moment focus, I've never heard it put that way. Genius. Yeah, well, I mean, to, to, to that point, Paul, because rapport is important, and you, you know that it's important. I, I know it's important, and it's still about rapport. Okay, it's still about rapport. But if you think about all the techniques that you know, and I know you're, 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 you know, very expert in the area of rapport, but think about if you could move all of those elements and techniques to get rapport with somebody about the now, rather than rapport about what are their values or what do they like, or it's just rapport about 
what is happening for, for the human beings in the space together right now, that's the moment. That's the moment where the other human being goes, you know me, you know me right now. I've never heard it, heard it put that way before. And this again, I, I'm not gonna belabor the point any further, but I've done some improvisational theater. I know in improv, you've gotta be in the now. If you're in your right. head, you're dead. Right, right. And, and you've also noticed how to watch, watch videos of people's impro is dead. It's just like, you know, there's a live show where you were there and it is the, a live impro show where you've got great performers and a great audience is the funniest thing you've yes, ever seen. Absolutely. The funniest thing you've ever seen. Because the whole audience are there now in the mess in the mess and going, we're all in a mess right now. Get us out of this. How are you gonna get us out of this mess? <laughs> You've got these brilliant moments, okay? <laughs> but you watch a video of, of even the best impro and it's never as funny as when you were, no. when you were there, Absolutely you know? Not. Something you said that really struck me, a lot of what you said at the um, behavior panel event struck me, but you said something that I've never heard before. I've heard so many, brilliant people talking about body language. Uh, my niece, I don't want to get, is someone who teaches it. You said body language is a metaphor. I've never heard that said before. That is really controversial and a pattern interrupt. I know what you mean by it, but explain to my audience and viewers, what, what did you mean when you said body language is, is a metaphor? Yeah, th there's some real power in this and I'm sure you, 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 you were triggered into that. Um, Body language is a name that we give to something which is not a language. And we call it body language because it's such an easier way to think about it. Because then we can write books like, I can read you like a book. And, and somebody picks up that book from the shelf and they get into it. And, it. and it's kind of a bait and switch because they get the knowledge that they need from there and hopefully understand actually you can't read people like a book because body language is not a language. It's a communication system, but it has very few of the elements that make up language. And, and you know, I could go into what those elements, some of what those elements are. When you asked that, I, I immediately called out and said syntaxes. I don't know if you remember. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, real language like English, French, Swahili, uh, Urdu, you know, have, have a super complex syntax. <laughs> yeah. Body language uh, doesn't have a syntax at all. And, you know, and anybody who goes, well, you know, what about, um, you know, American Sign Language? Well, that's a language. Okay, that's, that's a language and it's not body language, it's a systematic language. And, and what you're going to see is anybody who you see doing American Sign Language, they have body language alongside it. They have other nonverbal communication. In yeah, fact, maybe. if you want to see beautiful nonverbal communication, watch a group of people doing American Sign Language and, and see the, the passion uh, you know, and the and the emotion that they put into that, which isn't part of American Sign Language, okay? So, so look, you know, um, some of the things that body language lack is is syntax, um, uh, being being uh, displacement, which is to be able to talk about the past or the future. Yeah, you you can't give me give me a wink about something that happened in the past, Paul. <laughs> yeah, it's the same as any wink that you give that could be something about the future or now it's like it's like you can't do it can you you can't put it you can't displace it in any way you'd have to verbally do it and go you know um I, you know something odd happened yesterday <laughs> it's like oh i see oh you know you put it in a framework of language now i see where to place that piece of nonverbal communication you can't with body language be self-referential yeah. you can't talk about body language with body language okay language you can english we could have a long conversation about the nature of english as a language <laughs> You yeah, can't we do can that. Have a meta, we can have a meta conversation. You can't go meta with body language. Totally, totally. So look, you know, and, and look, here, here's the important thing about this, Paul, because I'm not trying to denigrate the power of, of body language. What I'm trying to do by letting people know this is 
the moment you know that it's not a language and that body language exists best in the now yeah then you see the power of it then you go well if it's a if it's a communication about the now now i know what to do with people right now now i know what to look out for right now now i know not to try and displace it now i know not to think that it's being self-referential now i can look at it and go what does this mean about the situation right now in front of us because this is communication not language hope that makes sense it does there's a, a just this is sort of a rough transition but i'm talking about the things that really struck me in the time you graciously shared with us at the event one of the things that hit me is you're talking about instinct mm. that, can you talk about the role of instinct and what it does and what we can and how it can get in the way of our making proper judgments, accurate judgments about people. Ac not judgment, but accurate evaluations about people. Yeah, so I'm glad you, I'm glad you bring that up. And, and by the way, you know, you're picking up on all the things that I find most interesting about, about, about nonverbal. Okay. My so, job is a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so instinct is important because we put a lot of weight on instinct being accurate. Trust your gut, we say. You know, trust your intuition. Nothing wrong with that. But your intuition and your gut is not interested in being accurate. It's interested in being safe. It's interested in defaulting to negatives, for example, for your safety now and accuracy tomorrow. Your instinct only wants you to be alive. That's all. It's just trying to sustain you so that you can live a little bit longer and then cognitively work out, hey, how accurate was I about that judgment that I instinctually made most of the time it won't even do that you'll just you'll just make your instinctual judgment you survive you get on with life so look we make instinctual judgments about people all the time ah oh, they're a great person oh i don't like them mm, don't like the look of that one. Oh, that one's definitely bad yeah oh that, that, they're a great person i can tell okay so what tends to happen is our negative judgments will be a default to the negative just to keep us safe okay because, you know, what's the downside? It just means that you make contact with one less person in your life, but potentially you you live. Okay? Well, I can put a pause. I know you're not Please. putting a pause in it, but I want to put... So then, how do we explain people who make so many poor judgments about people's character? If, their, if instinct is designed to minimize risk, how is it possible that so many people get taken in by sociopaths and narcissists? Yeah. I don't know if you've given, I, I know you, I, I don't know if you still do something with GQ about dating or men's issues. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so look, it, it, it's, it's in the name sociopaths. Okay. Sociopaths understand um, how to trigger your social priming, which isn't necessarily instinct. You got taught how to be specifically social. Yeah. Let me give you one thing that often you or uh, more specifically, many, many women will have been socially primed around. S smile and be nice. Be nice. OK. A sociopath will know that. And, and so the, the for some women, their instinct will be there's something up here. Don't like it. I'm, I'm alone in a dark car park. I'm carrying these bags. Yeah, this person's come up to me and said hey let me help you with that and my instinct says uh no no it's okay it's all right i'll carry them i'm good good instinct okay because you're in a dark place okay you're on your own okay if if they're a nice person that's fine okay but if they're a bad person you're going to escape okay and and you're going to live to rejudge them another day but here's what this sociopath does they go oh come on be nice I'm just trying to be nice. Give us a smile. It won't hurt you. Yeah. And then this person thinks back to their mum or their dad or their teachers or their leaders going, you know what? Be nice to people. And they get triggered and they go, oh, OK. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Give me a hand. Oh, what floor are you going to? Oh, OK. Uh, I'll, I'll help you up there. Make sense? So instinct in some ways can be short circuited or 
I don't know, I'm not making a plan here. It could be trumped or short circuited by social programming. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I know your social programming, I can send you exactly the right um, triggers to get you to comply or perform in a certain way. And this reminds me, and, and we have like five minutes simply because I could talk to you for hours, but you're, you're such a I'll busy. Come, I'll come back another time. All right. But yeah. you have something called scan. And one of the elements of scan is context. Looking yeah. at the context. And this, this kind of connects the dots to me that if you're going to evaluate someone, you have to look at the social context and their social programming. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. From, from both angles. And also, you've got to evaluate your own social context and your own social programming. Let me give you an example of that uh, for me personally. So part of nonverbal communication is time. OK, uh, you know that that you gesture towards me, Paul. It's not necessarily that you did that. It's when did you do that? OK, when in time did you do that? I as as an somebody who was brought up socially in the UK and England, time is re really important. So if you don't show up on time, I judge you negatively. Yeah. OK, you're probably a great person. You probably didn't mean it. OK, but my social programming says, no, 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 don't trust this person. Can't even show up on time. I don't even investigate what now what I need to do is suspend my judgment. And know, Mark, you got all this social programming, investigate more, suspend your judgment. OK, the context is your English and you judge people harshly around time and all kinds of other things. And I judge people positively about all kinds of other things that I need to know about uh, about that. So I hope, hope that makes sense that we can always know our own social and It judgment. sounds to me the biggest challenge there is humans. I've learned this as a meditator. Humans are so in love with certainty to oh, spend yeah. judgment and be willing to step into that uncertainty is what's required to be really good to be an excellent communicator to read people. Is, is that a good summary of what you're saying? I think it's a brilliant summary. You know, um, if you can find ways to have more confidence so you can step into more uncertainty, I guarantee the world will open up for you. <laughs> I mean, so it's not just confidence in, in, in that sense of assertiveness. And that's important as well in certain situations. But for me, more importantly, is the confidence to know I'm stable enough that I can step into more uncertainty so more of the world will open up for me. So I can choose more from more of the world. I can't think of a better note on which to end this. Mark, thank you so much for, for sharing your precious time. Uh, I, I can't say enough how touched I am by it and how much I personally enjoyed meeting you at the event market. People want to get in touch with you. You have so much to offer and you have so much value. Can you give us one or two ways that they can stay in touch or they can have a good introduction to your material? Yes, very simple. Just head over to truthplane.com, T-R-U-T-H-P-L-A-N-E, truthplane.com. You'll find all about me there and you can go off down various rabbit holes from that. <laughs> all right mark thanks very much stay for one second after we're done uh recording because i, I, I want to chat for a second will do everyone our special guest mark thank you so much and we'll see you on the next episode of the influencer's edge the influencer's edge is brought to you by the invisible influence series if you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion then make sure you text the word compel to 411321 that's compel to 411321 and if you're outside of the united states then use whatsapp and text the word compel to 1 909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Welcome to the Influencer's Edge. This is the place where you come to get the latest breakthroughs, cutting edge insights, 
tools, and techniques to leapfrog over the pack in sales, persuasion, and influence. Be sure you visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, tune in, and enjoy today's episode. The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Invisible Influence Series. If you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion, then make sure you text the word COMPEL to 411321. That's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1909. 741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Thank you for tuning in to the Influencer's Edge, where you get the latest breakthroughs, cutting-edge insights, tools, and techniques so you can leapfrog over the pack in sales, influence, and persuasion. Remember to visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com to enjoy even more great episodes like this one. We look forward to seeing you again on the Influencers Edge Show.